It's delightful for Laura Lee and I to be here with you. And um, even though this is an appointment that I make with Trinity Vero in each congregation, it still doesn't feel like an obligation. It actually feels like a joy. And it's always great to see people and see people that I saw the last time you know, that I was here. So my wife and I are very happy to be here at Trinity Church this morning. I say that even though the lessons this morning invite us to wrestle. They are not easy lessons. If what you hoped for in the sermon this morning was a kind of pat on the shoulder, as if to say, there, there, that's all right, you may not get it this morning. You might get it next week. You've got great pastors here. But today is actually more of a challenge than it is an affirmation. The good news is, is that no matter where we are in our relationship with God, God is always calling us and, as a result, challenging us to walk more deeply into his presence, to get to know him more, and to know that literally, no matter how long we might have walked with God, the fact of the matter is, is until we're translated into glory itself, we still feel like we're just getting started. There's so much more ahead of us than there is behind us in terms of what God actually wants to show us about who we are, about ourselves, and more importantly, about the plan and purpose that he has for our lives. Some people, in essence, come quite late to the party, but even though they do, the fact of the matter is, and there's a parable in the scripture that demonstrates that, they're still in. There's still something, in fact, for them to do. I underline the to-do part because those who are being confirmed and received this morning are actually committing themselves, as we discussed prior to the service, to do something that they're not just making a commitment to a certain set of beliefs. They're not just making a commitment to be within the body of this fellowship, Trinity Episcopal Church in the Diocese of Central Florida, although both of those things are important. But it's meant that those beliefs and the locus that is Trinity Church becomes the place where they wrestle with a call to, and here's the key word, a call to service. And that you'll notice when we go into the liturgy around confirmation, serve, servant, and service are repeated again and again and again to make the point that they're here to get on board and do something. To be about, in essence, God's business here in the world. Because, quite frankly, God has a plan and purpose. And his plan and purpose is to wrestle us out of our self-centered focus and work in us such an interior change that what begins to happen to us is that we actually begin to notice. We begin to notice other people. We begin to see the needs in our community. We begin to see people in a different light. And the question that will continue to come up again and again for a, notice, servant of Jesus Christ is, how may I serve? Lord, what would you have me do? But it's service that is offered in the companionship of the presence of God. The commitments that they will make are underlined by I will, and then the all-important prepositional phrase, with God's help. Even this, this act is, in fact, a Holy Spirit event. They're anointed with oil, and oil always represents the presence of the Holy Spirit. Because inevitably, what God asks of us is far bigger than anything we can ever accomplish on our own. In fact, if all we're looking at is the, in essence, sum total of our education and our talent and our capability, and then trying to apply those to a need, we fall short of what is, in fact, actually possible through us, because what God intentionally does, I mean, I don't like it, but that's how God operates, is that he intentionally puts us in places that are beyond our capabilities, challenging us to enter into situations 
that in fact demand more of us than what we have known in the past, so that we are literally thrown on the mercy of God. I will, with God's help, is not just a a kind of blasé affirmation, a part of the liturgy. It's actually a cry of commitment that says, the call is this big, and Lord, I'm only over here. I need you to bridge the gap. As I heard one bishop pray one time, he stood before this vast throng of people, and he looked up at everyone that was all, of course, staring at him, waiting for him to say something. He got very quiet, and he said, rather softly into the microphone, Lord, the ocean is so big and my boat is so small. That actually is the posture of what it means to walk with Christ. God placing us in positions, whether it be of responsibility or in relationships that ask more of us than we can naturally give. Because what God is after is not just that we do something. This is not just a religious version of the Kiwanis or the Lions or one of the various service organizations. No, no, no. It's actually to work in us a level of companionship with him, with God. So that what begins to happen is that things begin to happen that we realize we could never ever do on our own. And we have the extraordinary joy of knowing that in the midst of this place where we live, among these people that we know, I actually have the priceless privilege, and I mean it, of being available for God to use me in ways that are genuinely beyond my capability, making an eternal difference in the life of another person or in the life of a group, or in the life of a community. That's that's the tall order that is being asked of us, to which we will say, I will with God's help. Nothing better illustrates that than the opening story that we got from the book of Genesis. God promises Abraham nothing less than impossibility. Abraham and his wife, Sarah, are well past any procreation possibilities at all. In fact, do you remember when the angel spoke to Abraham that they would have a son? Sarah actually broke out in laughter and then got embarrassed because they caught her laughing because it just seemed so ridiculous to her that anything like that would even begin to happen. And so here we have the story this morning where God speaks to Abraham and says, guess what? Out of you and your wife are going to come successors, progeny that far outnumber the sand of the sea and the stars in the sky. How in the world is that even possible? How will that happen? And so he says, in essence, how do I know this is really God? And it's a good question to ask. And so God, in essence, works out a living demonstration that he could have never, ever replicated or manipulated. He brought, in in that encounter with God, animals. And they're all noted sacrificial animals. In other words, Abraham knew, just by his own religious background, that sacrifice was about to be offered. I mean, that was not strange to him. So they were prepared for sacrifice. What he didn't expect was what happened next. What happened next was, instead of God asking him to get the fire, wood, build it, and to burn the animals and to offer them to God, he fell into a deep sleep, and when he awoke, he was, there were no stars. He was, in fact, in a place of terrifying darkness. I don't know whether you've ever been in a place where there is no electricity, There are no stars in the sky, and all all around you is sheer, unadulterated darkness, but you can hardly see your hand in front of your face. And particularly, you're talking about Abraham out in the wilderness where he could have easily been bitten by a snake or attacked by some predator. There's a reason that darkness is called terrifying, 
and it's because he knows he is entirely unprotected in that moment from, from anything that could happen to him. And then in the midst of all of that, what appears, what appears are things that symbolize the sacrificial offering that he should have made on his own, the fire pot, which is just what you think it is. It's like a small cauldron with a handle. There's fire inside of it, and you bring it in, and you use that to set the sacrifices on fire. A torch that allows you to see what it is that you're doing, but they, in a way that feels like a magic show, appear in the air, unaided by any human assistance. That God himself, as a result, lights what Abraham offered. In other words, Abraham... Do you really believe I can do anything? Well, I'm not sure you have. You can. So let me show you. And God intentionally brings Abraham to the edge where he cannot, in this case, make the sacrifice light up and offer an acceptable offering to God. And especially in that religious system in that time, if he failed to make a proper offering, then he would be afraid of judgment. What could he do? All he could do was wait. And then, worse, he fell asleep. The point of the story is this. God has determined to do something in and through Abraham. And all God asks of Abraham is that he say yes. That's all. And God, in fact, will do the rest. That's the commitment that Paul is asking the Philippian Christians to make with him. Join with me in imitating me. And what he means by that is not that I'm such a perfect example, you need to do what I do. He knows better than that. But instead, he has said, he's talked about a commitment to say, what is the purpose and power of my life? My determined purpose, he says earlier before this reading, is that I might know him, meaning Christ, and the power that flows out of his resurrection, and I'm in essence willing to do whatever it takes to enter in more deeply into that relationship with Christ. So whatever is asked of me, I'm willing to count everything as loss for the sake of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. So God, have at me. <laughs> I don't know how many of us would do that. Many of us, I think, if we faced God, would want to go, <gasps> afraid of what might happen. But Paul understood the character of God. Paul knew that God loved him, that he brought mercy and grace and forgiveness his way, and that God was, as a result, imminently trustable. And it was because he knew that God was so imminently trustable that allowed him to be, make the kind of unqualified commitment, without hesitancies or caveats, to unqualified commitment to serve God as he has revealed himself in Jesus Christ. Because the whole message of Jesus is one of, I have come that they might have life and have it abundantly. So obviously, where we are, as we hear those kinds of calls is, oh, Lord, I need a lot of help, don't I? I need help because I'm not sure I know all of that about your character. There is still a part of me that would not want to join Paul in imitating him. I mean, look what happened to him. He ended up a martyr. So I need to know more about who you are that I might find a more concrete way of giving myself to you. I don't even know how to give myself unreservedly because I can feel the hesitancies within my own heart. And the whole idea, God, of putting me in situations that are beyond my capacity to control them, that actually sounds really scary to me. I I like being in control, God. I like being able to be in a place where I can hedge my bets and I can plan the outcomes and I can work out a way to get from here to there knowing that if I take these steps, this really will happen toward the end. Can't we work something out so that I can live like that? Do I have to say yes unreservedly? God always says yes to the answer to that question. 
He wants us fully. The joy is, is that he's extraordinarily patient. He will take our trust in him one step at a time, deepening it each step of the way. But the goal is the same regardless of the pace. The goal is, oh God, I want to do whatever it takes to know you and to walk in relationship with you and to be an instrument that you use in service to other people for the sake of your kingdom. That's as true for every baptized person there is. That standard does not change. So today, as we enter into this confirmation liturgy, be careful what you are committing yourself to. Take the words seriously. Know something of your heart, and if you're willing to say, in essence, I will with God's help, we will. Know that God is also asking something of you in that commitment. In the same way that he is asking of these who are making this commitment publicly with the rest of us. It's a commitment to availability. It's a commitment to trust beyond your capacity to determine the outcome. It's the adventure of knowing more and more about the good character of God who promises to never leave us or forsake us. This is not small stuff. Annie Dillard once wrote, I'm surprised when people come into church that they don't hand out life preservers and flashlights and crash helmets. It's dangerous what we're doing in here. And she's right. Rowan Williams, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, talked about liturgy as a furnace where we face the very essence of God and the truth about ourselves. It is anything but benign. So, come on. Let's see what happens. As we're learning and finding new ways to say yes, with God's help. And let's see what God will do as we, even with fear, extend our hands to him and say, okay, here we go and see what the Lord does in our midst. Amen.